Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture on Fisher's exact test for STAT 3150 statistical computing. The objectives for this lecture are uh, learning how to use Fisher's exact test to test for independence of two categorical variables, and also understand the connection between Fisher's exact test and what we discussed in the previous lecture, namely uh, permutation tests. So I'll start with a bit of motivation. Um, and if you're interested in that kind of story, I encourage you to look up this book called The Lady Tasting Tea, How Statistics Revolutionized Science in the 20th Century uh, by David Salzberg. But the, the story goes that um, at the time that Fisher was uh, active um, in, in the statistical community, there was this lady in England who claimed that she could always tell whether milk or tea was poured in her cup first. Um, and so Fisher was very skeptical and he designed an experiment to test this claim. So what he did is that he randomly filled four cups with tea first and then four cups with milk first. Um, and then he asked the lady to guess which four cups were filled with milk first. So she knew that there were exactly four cups that were filled with milk first and she had to figure out which one of the eight um, those were. And here are the results of the experiment summarized in a two by two table. So each row corresponds to the actual truth. So um, whether uh, a cup was filled with milk first or tea. And then for the columns, what we have is the guess from the lady. So for example, we can see that uh, she correctly guessed that three cups were filled with milk first. Um, and then she missed one. And then similarly, she correctly guessed that three cups were filled with tea um, and she missed one of those as well. And so we get this contingency uh, table here. And so what Fisher was trying to use that data to make a case that she was just randomly guessing. So that was her ran that was Fisher's null hypothesis that the lady is just guessing randomly and not really basing, uh, she doesn't really have any skill to detect um, which liquid was poured first. And the key thing, and the reason why Fisher designed the experiment the way he did, is that under the null hypothesis, uh, the value in the top left cell, so in other words, the correct milk guesses, um, that value actually follows a hypergeometric distribution. And so we can actually compute um, the probability of correctly guessing three for that particular top left cell. Um, you can use the definition of hypergeometric with all of the binomial coefficients, um, but we're just going to use the d hyper function in R. And remember the d functions, uh, what they do is that they compute the density or the probability mass function. So in this case it computes the value um, of uh, the probability mass function at three, and the the parameters of the hy uh, the hypergeometric distribution are set as follows: uh, m is equal to four, n is equal to four, and k is equal to four. Uh, I, I encourage you to review uh, the definition of the hypergeometric if those parameters don't make any sense. Uh, but what we get is that the probability of the guess that she made is about 0.23, so it's actually pretty high. Um, and, and, of course, this is assuming a random uh, guess. So even if the lady is guessing randomly, the probability of observing what, what happened is about 0.23. So if we want to compute a p-value for this particular null hypothesis, uh, remember that for p-value we want the probability of observing uh, under the null hypothesis what we observed or a more extreme value for the test statistic. So what would be a more extreme value in this case? Well, a more extreme value would be if she had guessed four correctly. So if she had guessed everything correctly. And so the p-value would be the sum of the probability mass function at x equals three and x equals four. And so if we compute those two quantities and add them up, like I'm doing here in the R code, uh, we get a p-value of 0.24. And so given that probability, what Fisher did is that he concluded that there was a lack of evidence that the lady could really tell which was poured first. Of course, he could have increased the sample size. Um, 
because of uh, we know that for low sample sizes sometimes we just don't have enough power to reject the null hypothesis um, but this is this is what happened and this is what he did and so this is what this was the beginning of what we now call Fisher's exact test and Fisher's exact test is a test of independence between two factors or two categorical variables in this example that we looked at uh, the two categorical variables are one, uh, the true liquid poured first, whether it's milk or tea. And the second factor is the lady's guess. Um, but the key thing to remember is that Fisher's exact test actually relies on a very important assumption, that the row totals and the column totals should be fixed by design. In other words, there should be exactly, um, in our example, there should be exactly four cups with milk first and tea first. And the lady should guess exactly four for each category. And so this is a very key assumption. And of course, as I, as I pointed out, it holds in this particular experiment because Fisher took the time to tell the lady uh, how, many, how many cups of each there were to guess. Why is that assumption so important? Well, it's, it's, it implies that the value of a single cell in our, in our examples here, it completely determines the value of the other three cells. Because as soon as we know one cell, we know um, the value next to it because the row sums are fixed, and the value below it or above it um, because the column sums are also fixed. And in other words, any of the four cells is a valid test statistic, and they all follow a hypergeometric distribution. And so we picked uh, the lower, le the, the top left cell for our experiment, but we could have picked another one of the cells. For example, we could have picked the lower left cell, which corresponds to the wrong milk guesses. And if we go through the same exercise, we get the exact same p-value. Uh, but note here that we need to do, uh, there's a bit of a difference in terms of what would be considered an extreme value. So if there's just one, one wrong milk guess, a more extreme value than this would be uh, no wrong milk guess. And so if we compute the p-value using the d-hyper function, uh, we can check we exactly get the same value as before. Okay, so that's Fisher's exact test. So what's the connection with permutation tests? And so under the null hypothesis, uh, as I mentioned, the value of any cell follows a hypergeometric distribution. And uh, we can actually quantify the likelihood that a permutation of the data would lead to a valid 2 by 2 table. So a table that uh, has the correct row and the, the correct column sums. And it turns out that as we permute the data, the frequency of each configuration of, those, uh, of this data set into a 2 by 2 table, um, those frequencies converge to a hypergeometric probability. And we can actually test this. Um, we can just generate um, some permutations, right? And, and then check whether we get a similar p-value or not. So this is what I'm doing in the example here. So first, I'm creating the data set. Um, and I'm just creating a vector with the first four values are milk. The first four value, the la first, sorry, the last four values are t. I'm, I'm creating this using the rep function and the each equals four argument. And now let's do some, some permutations. So first I'm going to sample or permute the observations in data uh, without replacement, so using the sample function. Now data perm is a rearrangement of all of those uh, values from data. And we're just going to treat the first four values as what the lady guess was milk. And then, similarly, the last four values would be what the lady had guessed uh, is t. And so if we just look at the first four values of the permuted data, uh, we can check how many of them are equal to milk. And that would be the upper, uh, the top left cell in our permuted um, data set. And so we repeat this. We do a thousand simulations, a thousand permutations, and every time we keep track of what's the value in the top left cell of the 2x2 two two table. 
And so we know that um, what we're looking for is the frequency of how many times we got three or four. So we can get this via permutation uh, p-value. So remember, we're taking the sample mean of the vector 3, which is the value we observed, comma results, which is all of the value from the permutations. And then we're counting the proportion of how many of those are greater than or equal to the observed value 3. And when we do this, we can see that we got essentially the same p-value as before, 0.2347 instead of 0.2428. Uh, so we do get a very similar p-value. And this is the connection between Fisher's exact test and permutation tests. The idea behind Fisher's exact test is very much in the same spirit as the permutations. We're looking at the frequency or the, the proportion of all of the different configurations that are possible that would have given rise to the table we saw under the null hypothesis. Uh, but of course, in Fisher's time, uh, the computational resources were limited, so he wasn't really thinking in terms of generating those permutations. So he couldn't actually permute the data. Uh, so instead, what he did is that he set up the experiment in a way that he could exactly compute the probability of each permutation. And this is why we call it Fisher's exact test. It's exact in the, in the sense that we, we can compute the probabilities exactly under the assumptions of fixed margins. Uh, and I'll conclude by noting that you can actually construct a valid permutation test that doesn't rely on that assumption. Um, and so in some sense, the permutation tests are more general.